I got to zoom in. Hopefully this uh, this thing decides to focus so you guys can look at my ugly mug. Um, hey guys, how you doing? It's Alex and today I'd like to um, talk about coyote swaps and I want to bring in Frank on the conversation. Frank Perdomo from Power by the Hour. He is the coyote swap expert. So I need to somehow invite his ass and I forgot how to do it. So again, bear with me guys. <laughs> it's a tremendous pain in the butt. Let me see how you do it. Hey guys, that's pretty good. You guys, a bunch of guys on already. That's awesome. That's awesome that you guys give a shit. Um, it's really cool. So, going to go live with PBH Performance, which is, oh, we're going to talk coyote swaps, do's and don'ts. There's been a couple of hilarious things that have um, happened lately, so we wanted to talk about it. Oh, look at that. What do you got? Look at the paint. Damn, Frank. What's up? my man? office, baby. It's my you're office. Looking, you're looking good. Thanks, man. I appreciate you uh, coming out with me, man. Well, thank you for having me. It's It's been so long since I've seen you. Yeah, like uh, three hours. Yeah, we 69th yep. earlier, 77th. So, uh, well, that's <laughs> okay, Frank, let's talk. Let's get right into it. Let's talk about do's and don'ts on coyote swapping your Mustang. Now, you literally work in the industry that's 90% of the stuff you deal with. And I'd like to talk about common mistakes people do on setups and wiring and stuff like that. In your experience and what you've seen, what are the most common mistakes people do when coyote swapping anything an f100 a fairmont whatever um there's a couple big ones that they're more situational and really kind of global where you got to avoid it every time because things can be different um if it's really you know cheap coyote engines everybody's ah. looking for a budget way of getting it. uh f-150s are a great idea but you really have to study what you're going to be doing with your swap because if you get a great deal on that F-150 motor and uh, you save a thousand bucks, but it doesn't come with everything you need, for example, or maybe you're going to use our control pack and you got yourself a Gen 2 motor, there's going to be limitations on certain things. You may have to change the engine harness, throttle body, intake cams, any of the stuff that's necessary. That thousand dollars you spend just turned into maybe you know fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars you got to spend on and time, and uh, it's not really a great situation. Uh, right. So, as always, with any build, you got to forecast really what you want out of it, how much you want to spend, and really have a goal in place for now, maybe a year from now, two years from now, so that you're buying towards that final goal and you're not spending money twice. That's one big thing. Um, really overestimating some people's general knowledge of how cars work, uh, how wiring works. <laughs> Is, is is a hot spot. Uh, we get that a lot. Um, oddly enough, you do have to hook the alternator to your battery, so it'll charge. Wait a minute. Wait, whoa, whoa. You're just, you're just blowing my mind. <laughs> you got to hook up the happen, alternator to the battery? It can happen to anybody. <laughs> it can happen to anybody, and it's, it's not really a knock on that individual, but, you know, we talk about plug-and-play harnesses. Ford Racing sells them. We sell them. And uh, it's really easy to take the alternator plug and plug in the alternator and do everything else, and, and you miss that. And I, I can totally say that happened. I'm no genius when it comes to these cars. I've learned through osmosis, being around really smart people and really accomplished techs. So I give them all the credit. But obviously, if the battery needs to be charged and the thing that charges it is the alternator, somehow they have to connect because they don't work wirelessly. Um, um, we're not what there are the yet. Things that we, what are the things that we'd experienced – this last couple of days have you seen that is missing a very crucial component, especially for starting a coyote. What have you seen, seen missing on some of these engines? Missing in the back. like component wise in part in the back. Oh, think, think of yes. in the back. Again, something that can happen to anyone. And it's even <laughs> happened to us at the shop on accident. Um, we had to pull a transmission out. The exciter ring that goes in the back of the crankshaft it comes off really easy if you don't have a flywheel or a flex plate on. So if you get a junkyard motor and it doesn't have a flywheel or a flex plate, even if it does have one on there, peel it back. Make sure the exciter wheel is there for the crank trigger on the crank uh, position sensor. Because if not, you're going to get everything together, go to fire it up, and you're going to have all your friends and family there, the tuner ready to go, uh, fuel in the tank, and you're not going to have any spark. And you're going to have to pull the transmission out, the exhaust out, everything that's related to it to be able to replace it and then try again and see potentially what other issues you may have to run into because there's always something extra. Now, let's talk about pricing because a lot of people, unfortunately, know that this swap is awesome, it's legit, it works, period. 
but mm. they try to go the cheap route. What would you allocate budget wise for a properly done coyote swap? I'm saying new motor. I'm saying new everything new. Um, what would you think roundabout? And let's say you do the work yourself. Hard parts. What are you looking at? Motor, control pack, whether it be PBHs or let's say it's like a Ford racing deal. Doesn't necessarily have to be PBH specific. What are you looking for price wise, uh, depending on combos? Tough question because you have to answer a bunch of other questions to be able to get down to the brass tacks, right? So is it going to be power steering? Is it going to be AC? Is it a Fox body or a new edge or an S197 you're doing? Is it a 32 Ford? You know, all these things are going to have their own uh, answers and their own budgets because you have to address certain things. Fox bodies need K-members. K-members sometimes require coilovers. If you have stock struts in the front, there goes that. So now you're spending 1800 bucks just to get the K-member in place if you want a maximum motorsports deal plus motor plus control pack. And, oh, yeah, I need to figure out gauges. And, you know, I want the Dakota Digital. I want a Florida 5.0. So, you know, lay it all on the table and really, again, plan out what you want to do. But bare bones, if you're just going to put a motor in there and no gauges, no AC, no power steering, I mean, you got – a on the high end, probably a seventy-five hundred dollar engine, uh, probably about eighteen hundred to two thousand dollars in control pack, depending on what that engine comes with right. and what's available from us. Um, is your transmission going to work? Yeah, I don't know. If you got a Fox body, no, no, your transmissions are really going to work. So you're buying a training. So I, what I try to preface or ballpark for everybody is going to be probably about a ten to fifteen thousand dollar parts list if you're going new. Obviously, you can cut that down drastically by getting a used engine, but, again, it depends on what you're getting and what you may have to buy to make it work and what you're going to do with it. So you can see stuff get done in the $8,000 range parts-wise, and it's just running up and down the street with open headers and stuff like that, or you can have a really nice coyote swap where I would say if you brought it to us parts-wise and labor and everything – we're probably talking about a good, you know, twenty grand plus to kind of get one moving and rolling, tuned and, and going up and down the the road, um, and that's a hard number to look at, especially you know for most of our clients, there aren't a whole lot of people jingling around twenty grand and change in their pocket. So um, exactly, but but I understand, plan. I understand, I understand the allure because you can build something that not everyone has, right? You can build your own, cater to yourself, have a body that's not being made anymore and you can make, you know, the modern power, modern fuel economy, modern tuning. Um, have you seen a trend with what's being coyote swapped lately uh, as opposed to, you know, the good old fashioned Fox body Mustang? Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously Mustangs, we're getting a lot more S197s. A uh, lot of questions from the V6 S197 guys. Um, <laughs> Sorry, sorry. There's, there's a lot of them out there, um, and oddly enough, it's not a bad car to do. I think the, the one thing that scares those guys off a lot is gauges. How do I get them to work? There is no plug and play. So, you know, we can't really – we don't know exactly what to walk you through there, so you, there's something you have to figure out. And, unfortunately, again, um, that's beyond normal automotive knowledge. That's really in-depth you know, and trying to figure things out. If it doesn't work, there's no one to really call or, or do, and nobody wants a, a halfway done project dropped off of their shop to fix the gauges. So, you know, right, right. there's a stopping point there. But the S197 guys are starting to call a lot. Um, obviously, the three-valve has its limitations uh, in, uh, in durability and, and power. Which What do you mean? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? I mean, without the three-valve, we were the coyote. Oh my God! You know how many times I hear that, and I just wanted to just shut up, just shut up, guys. Really. Uh, so but, yeah. Okay, so I, F100 I know that F one hundred F one hundred guys are the biggest leap. I mean, if it's top two vehicles, we get calls for F one hundred and Fox Body Mustang or it uh, Fair Lanes uh, plus size Fords from the sixties and seventies Lincolns. They're really hot, uh, mainly because you don't have to cut them up to get the motors in there. Sixties Mustangs. Not as much because you got to kind of have to reinvent the whole front end of the car just to wedge tight in there. this coyote in there. So, and it's not like they're looking at that going, oh, let me put a four cylinder in. You know, no, it's not going to happen either. So, it's it's a lot more of a commitment and a lot more expensive naturally, unless you can do it yourself. Right now, I tuned a F two fifty, a seventy seven F two fifty with your control pack, the PBH control pack for first gen coyotes. 
Can you kind of elaborate as to why, what's so different, and what are the benefits of running a PBH control pack over the Ford Racing for a, for a Gen 1 Coyote, basically? Well, right now, the only reason you would be using our control pack on a Gen 1 is if you had a 6R80. Ford Racing does not offer a 6R80 control pack for the Gen 1. They just have it for the Gen 2. Ours can okay. be used with a Gen 2 motor and with a GP500 engine, um, but obviously the Gen 2s require more parts, which you may or may not have, and you got to shell out another 700 bucks just to have a chance to, to get it going. We are actively working on a solution for the manual transmission Gen 1 guys where our body harness can be used in conjunction with maybe that, you know, crank a pallet deal you got or a, a parts farm motor or a pullout uh, where you have the PCM, you got all the sensors, you got an engine harness, you even got a manual transmission harness. At that point, you just need our body harness. You don't have to go out and buy a whole control pack, and that'll help uh, get a lot of the budget squeezed down because potentially you can save about 800 bucks there alone uh, because you're using existing parts and you only need to buy a harness instead of a whole control pack from Ford Racing. So in the future, we'll have that uh, comparison in a sense. Really what sets our body harnesses kind of apart from what you see from Ford Racing is just subtle differences. The way we loom them is just about the same way they do. The connectors are all OEM. Our fuse block, though, is a little bit more petite, and it does have a connector. So if you're passing it through a firewall, if you've installed a, a, a control pack from Ford Racing, you want to put the fuse block inside, you literally have to unpin the entire harness from the fuse block, pass it through the firewall, and then repin it under your dashboard and then mount it, which is not comfortable. So we always designed ours with a connector in it, so you can just disconnect it and pass it through and reconnect it and do what you got to do. Um, everything else is just, you know, wiring, making sure they're all factory colors, making sure you can use a factory diagram book to uh, do diagnosis in the future. So um, making sure all those things are, you know, kind of keeping the builder and the installer in mind when we're developing the parts, not just cost, um, has really kind of set it a ahead a little bit. than I would say what else is out there. Um, and the fuse block literally fits in the palm of your hand. So it, it makes things uh, Oh, I remember seeing it. Yeah, I remember how you guys uh, showed showed me a, a setup like that before. Now, when it comes to tuning these cars, like tuning a control pack, do's and don'ts. Now, we 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 want to talk about supercharger stuff because it's the only kind of issue I've seen on the tuning end of things is when people throw a supercharger on with a certain throttle body. They don't know which generation throttle body to use. Can you can you kind of dial that in for us? Kind of give us do's and don'ts when it comes to supercharger throttle bodies and depending on which control pack you're using. Well, obviously, uh, there's a difference between Gen 1 and Gen 2 electronically, PCM, and some of the components. Throttle body is one of them. The I believe the connectors are just about the same, and they will plug in, but they're different. They're they're calibrated differently. They work differently. The, the winding inside of them is different. Um, so if you do get a Gen 2 motor and you're using a Gen 1 PCM, you're going to need a throttle body. If you're using a VMP or a Roush supercharger that has a GT500 throttle body, you don't have to worry about Gen 1 or Gen 2 because there's only Gen 1 GT500 throttle bodies, and there's calibrations for that change. If you're using GT throttle bodies or maybe like we saw uh, on the Whipple uh, car or truck, excuse me, um, it, it's not an option. You, you have to do the Gen 1 version of it for it to be calibrated, whether that be really mechanical or maybe just that the ability to do that is not there or hasn't been developed tuning-wise and no one's going to pay, you know, the absorbent amount of money to figure out or be the guinea pig on it. It's cheaper just to buy the right throttle body or get the right kit. So when you're shopping those blowers, if they have a vital component like the throttle body, make sure it matches up to the year of the PCM. That way you don't have to, you know, return something or try to sell it on eBay to cover up a mistake. Gotcha. Now, are, is the 4R200, which we spoke about shortly, or like I spoke about briefly, I'll get more in depth once one gets on my car. Mm -hmm. um, is the 4R200 a popular Coyote swap car item that you've seen lately? Like are a lot of people that are swapping their vehicles opting for the 4R200 package? Not not yet. I think once there's more guys out there running it and proving that they work essentially and, and they work for them, uh, your car is an example and, and other clients that we've sent it to, I think it'll be more of a, a easier transition. At the same time, it's a, a lot of the guys that we've met that are doing kind of more hardcore builds with coyotes are opting for more mechanical options with transmission. So they're not even doing the 6R80s 
they're reaching, they may have already had a Glide or they may already have a Turbo 400. They get an adapter bell housing and I'm just changing the power under the hood. So right. we don't have as many, I guess, uh, opportunities in that sense, but um, we do have a few clients that are doing coyote swaps. One has a GT500 motor that's pretty powerful and he's going for R200 and the other guy is doing a turbo coyote. One of them is, and I think I saw he's joined us on the broadcast, is a gentleman doing the twin turbo Buick Grand National uh, with the twin turbo Coyote. He's looking to go for two hundred as well. Excellent. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I always wondered if you were getting a lot of those questions because sometimes when I stop by, I hear a lot of the stuff that's going on on the phone, and I hear a ton of Coyote swap questions. Now, for the do-it-yourselfers, there's a lot of do-it-yourselfers that – either buy the control pack and ask you guys question on it because honestly I think Ford is redirecting people to power by the hour when it comes to certain tips, tricks, things like that. Now, what is it that makes the power by the hour control pack a little easier to install or work with than say like a Ford Racing? I remember seeing the connectors, how they're marked and how everything is really labeled properly. Talk a little bit, a little bit about that if you don't mind. Well, the, you know, Ford Racing does a, a good job of getting that put together. Uh, I don't think they're really – you know, leaps apart. You know, they're not, you know, a, you know, apples and oranges, I guess. Um, both of our harnesses are quality. They have factory wiring. Like I said earlier, the, the fuse block is something that uh, they just recently changed, but they didn't add the connector to it, uh, which a lot of guys were hoping for because that's kind of a pain to do. Um, and, in fact, the new one, I don't think you can unpin it, so you got to pass the entire harness kind of inside out to get it through a firewall, uh, which is a little problematic. <laughs> um, but um, I don't think there's a big difference between the two. There's really only a few ways to kind of skin this cat in particular because we're all working off of factory wiring. Where there's a big difference out there is the alternative options outside of the control packs, right? Um, companies like, for example, Ron Francis have offered – control pack or wiring harness in particular as a kit for a long time for the coyotes, but it hasn't been a favorite for the, the builders and the, and the installers because it's literally build your own harness. So you have this fuse block that looks like a thousand watt amp. Um, it has all the inputs into it and all the fuses ganged up and they give you just spools and spools of wiring with a connector on it. And then you have to basically run it, make the length, mount this thing somewhere and then, uh, make your own harness, loom it, and and, and uh, do the, the convoluted tubing and everything to protect it. And uh, that's a lot of work. I mean, for a Fox Body guy, there's no point in doing that because I, I don't know where you're going to put it. You're going to put it under the seat? I mean, put it in the trunk? Now the harness is how much longer? That's not really a good solution. And to the street rod guys, they they go with Ron Francis. They've, uh, they've worked on them for a long time, and rightfully so. They've been a great uh, solution to that. But on this one, I think uh, – the control packs really have it licked using the factory components. And the other thing I'll mention is um, trying to use standalone controllers. Remember, uh, Ford puts a lot of development into these PCMs to make them work perfectly, and it's very hard to mimic that with different computer systems. So 6R80s and these standalone controllers, it's, it's an uphill battle for the standalone controllers and the tuning of them to really get them to the level where the factory computers can take them. And we know we can go with all these tuners working on them and everything kind of set forth. So it's been a little bit of a struggle for the guys using the standalones to get the transmissions to do A and B and C and D perfectly. Um, we right. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff that has to happen with the 6 already. It's not just command the 1, 2, 2, 3, two, you know, there's 1, 3, 1, 5, you know, 1, 5, 2, 5, 2, 6, and then the downshift and the pressures – it's just a tremendous pain in the ass. Um, real quick, I wanted to talk about the brackets. You guys offer Coyote Swap bracketry to make installations easier. Um, I noticed you guys have an AC bracket. You also have a power steering bracket, so they can reuse 96 or 99. I'm not 100%, so I don't want to misquote. Tell me about the brackets real quick what you for, for your Coyote Swap stuff. Well, the gist of it is, is we developed our brackets to essentially use the accessories from the 96 to 2010 Mustang GT and put them on a Coyote. So for the guys that had a GT that wanted to upgrade to a Coyote, it was kind of like a peel and stick installation. You pull the accessories off, yank the motor, put the Coyote in there, and then put the accessories back on without having to detach them, basically, uh, in theory. Um, what's happened over time is we 
got rid of the option for the 96 to 10 alternator because the brackets, although they worked, um, they needed a lot more, you know, kind of support to make them really 110% like OEM fit. And the Coyote right. alternators outperformed the older alternators uh, in voltage. So you got 15 volts out of the Coyote with computer control regulation, and then you had about 12 and a half max out of the older styles without that. So we wanted to match up factory computer with factory voltage, do the Coyote alternator, and then in doing that, we also made sure it worked with the Roush and the VMP supercharger belt drives, which has opened up a lot of doors for guys to supercharge their Coyote swaps, maybe not now, but a year down the road, um, you, you don't have to rethink the whole car. The accessory drive, we got you. If you get with us at first NA, we got a supercharger outfit kit that's like 85 bucks, and you can put a blower on there, and you can, now you can worry about doing your heat exchanger mounting and your intercooler pump, and you're good to go. Uh, everything else works. So, and it works well. Belts align, okay. then you flip. You know, our brackets, um, but it's probably sturdy enough to pull the engine out of the damn car if you really wanted to. So, um, it's, it's high quality, well thought out for the uses that we kind of see being needed in the aftermarket. So, as far as the other pieces, you know, it's available as a kit. You can buy it a la carte. If you're building something and you got alternator figured out and AC figured out, but I just need the power steering bracket, we got you there. We can sell you just the AC uh, brackets. We can help you out with that. Uh, if you just need the alternator bracket, I have a lot of guys relocating the alternator to use forward-facing headers uh, because they're not using accessories. Well, let's move the alternator up top, and now you have both sides of the engine available to run whatever turbo manifold you want to use or make something custom. Uh, we've actually sold a lot of those for guys using motor plates as well. Okay. What um, is the coolest Coyote swap you've come across uh, yourself? Something that utilized the stuff that you guys offer and everything like that. I have my favorite. I just kind of want to know your favorite. Man, I I want to say the Mustangs are are it, but the F100 guys are killing it. They're they're building some really cool stuff. It, it the, a truck or a project like that kind of puts the Mustang at a, a disadvantage, right? You're you have so many more options as far as creativity with an F100 that's patina or maybe it's smoothed out or it's a unibody, it's slammed on the ground, it, it lays frame, and then it's got a coyote motor in it with 650 horsepower and it has burnouts so sparking the frame on the ground. So those always have more of an appeal to me in particular, but I'm a Fox body guy. That's what I have. And, you know, you take all the stuff that we know about foxes and what we usually do to them and you put in a coyote that is smoother running, has more capabilities with a stock block, and now – the price kind of comes down to having that 600 or 800 horsepower twin turbo Fox supercharged Fox that you didn't have before where it was a, you know, a short run car or trailer queen. Now you put that coyote motor in there and it opens up a lot more doors uh, to do some cool shit. And uh, we're all about doing cool shit. So yeah, it, it, there's one for every group. I would say um, I know Caleb from the Fox cast is doing a really nice swap right now. Just clean, really, really clean, really meticulous, and that to me kind of takes the cake with the the Fox Body guys. It, it stands out the most when everything's smooth, everything's painted, everything's thought out. You can see the engine bay, not just a bunch of wiring. Um, and the F100 guys kind of take the cake with overall look, I think, and what they can do because they're forced to address all those things because the truck's old. Right. Now, I know the Mob Steel Lincoln is probably my favorite Coyote Swap anything. It's just so freaking cool. It's so big. It's so low, and it just has balls. I mean, it does burnouts better than any of them. I like – I'd love to see a trend of long, big, old, uh, you know, Fords, mm -hmm. like um, the, like the Star, Starsky and Hutch – what is that, A uh, the Starsky and Hutch uh, car? What is it? I think it's Torino? Gran Torino. Yeah, I'd love to. Leave, I'd love to see Gran Torino's you know coyote swap with like a TBS blower or even a Whipple for those of you guys that like to uh, have boyfriends. Um, <laughs> but basically, I love because that's what was missing back then, right? The, the 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 engine that's small per se. You know, to get one of those things going back in the day, you need a 460. You know, with like a two kits to get them off the ground, just to get going now with a little Coyote engine with a any kind of blower, it can make 600, you know, lay rubber for hundreds of feet and, and be happy. So I'd love to see more of a trend of Coyote swap, long, you know, late 60s, early 70s boards, in my opinion. Some guys said right here to, to Coyote swap a, a Corvette. That'd be great if someone had the balls to Coyote swap a Corvette. I know you guys dyno to Coyote swap Porsche. 
We did uh, back at the old shop. There's been pictures rolling around of guys with um, coyotes and GMs. I, I think I saw one in a Corvette. I did see one for sure in a. Uh, I wonder if it was a '68. Um, it wasn't a Camaro. It was a uh, Firebird. The guy was doing that sent us pictures. So they're they're doing them. I had one guy call me who was so fed up with his Mopar. Uh, pricing and availability that he was going to put it into a uh, uh, wasn't it was kind of like a super bird looking like replica and he was just yep. sick of it and he wanted reliability and, and cost effectiveness and he couldn't get anything period correct cheap and you know it was either that or do a v10 or uh he wanted to be different so you know hey for all do it man whatever makes you happy we'll do some custom coil covers on there with mopar logos and nobody know the difference um, they'll just think it's something new that came out of a Jeep. Uh, Broncos are awesome. They they look great. They're, I mean, they're probably the hottest thing right now. And they're getting the most money auction wise. So there's all sorts of groups out there and companies switching over to doing just Broncos. And they're selling these Broncos for like a hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars. Um, oh because they're such high demand with a Coyote motor in them. I was at Bear Jackson Gateway Classics, hundred fifty k to start. We have that uh, Land Rover there, uh, Ultimate Warrior. Those things are 125 grand to start, plus options. Ooh, um, man. So it's the money's flowing right now. So there's all sorts of cool shit going on. Um, but yeah, the plus size Fords, the Lincolns, a lot of Lincolns getting done. I forgot to mention that earlier. Mob Steels was a, a really cool project because it was done, it was delivered at SEMA, it was displayed, and then when they went to kind of fine tune it, it really wasn't what they expected and we ended up having to take everything out that had been sent to them before and put in our stuff and uh it worked like a charm it worked like it was supposed to work uh lund okay. racing tuned it and that video of them doing the burnout they were super excited to be able to get to that point because it was supposed to be at that point before sema and it never was it, it just oh, it oh so it, it wasn't a running driving car when it got to sema yeah, they, they still had some work to do. To want. It ran and it putt-putted and kind of got there, but it wasn't 100%. You know, it wasn't, like, deliverable in a sense. Um, okay. There were some struggles there with what was done, and they're not the only ones. Uh, there's been a lot of projects like that that we've gotten on the back end of them and helped guys kind of square them away um, yep. and get them working properly so they can enjoy them. Uh, they're big investments. They're staples of these companies, and – there's always a rush to get it to SEMA and there's always that SEMA crunch. Yeah. Um, so I imagine things happen and we have, we've never been in that position, so I don't know how stressful it is, but I imagine it's a pain. It's, in the dude, it's <laughs> stupid. It, it's dumb. Real quick. I want to try to take some questions cause we're about a half hour in or close to it. So I'll just start kind of going through the, you know, some of the history and just kind of ask you some of the questions. Short bed Chevy killer asked, uh, have you guys done a gen one lightning yet? We haven't done one in-house. Um, I know we've sold components to guys that are doing them. Um, there's one gentleman here local to us named Dennis Cooley that um, he took his truck. He's got a 93, I believe, black. It's uh, It's got four-link suspension in it, really nice wheels. Uh, he had Thunder Autosports do the swap, and he used some of our components to get that one done. And that truck's just about almost to the point where he's ready to paint it, but he's going to be driving it for a while before he gets to that point. Um, that's a great truck because, I mean, they were always underpowered and they weren't easy to make more power. So when you're putting a Coyote in there, I mean, you're talking about 400 horsepower off the, the hit and then putting a blower on maybe 600. I mean, who's going to not want that with a six-speed automatic? Even my – I had a Gen 2 Lightning, and I would have loved it to have the 6R80 behind that motor because cruising back and forth to the shop, I mean, I was cruising at like almost 2,800 RPM with that uh, 4R100 that was in there, and I would have liked her to be able to kick into a little bit better overdrive. It would have saved me a bunch of money when uh, 93 octane was almost $4 a gallon. Um, but, you know, it wasn't available at the time. I, I ended up getting rid of the truck. But what's coming down the pipeline from us, something we're going to be developing soon too, is going to be, the Gen 2 stuff, but more specifically the EcoBoost twin turbo. So what's going to be interesting there is to see how many people hop onto that in the Mustang world and start putting the EcoBoost, EcoBoost. Stick with the 6R80 behind it in cars and seeing how fast they go. And then the F100 guys are going to right in line for that. Awesome. Now, Jose with the Forte 
Here? Ugh. Um, so, he says, opinion on the GT500 engine into a Crown Vic by Cletus McFarlane. You're, you're aware of that swap going yeah. on. I, I know about the swap and have my own thoughts, but I wanted you to voice your opinion on it or thoughts or whatever. If you, get, if you can find one for the right price, um, it's a really tough debate whether you should be going Coyote or not because if you can find a powertrain for, let's say, $8,000, $10,000, you have a supercharged 6060 transmission 5.4 motor sitting there ready to go. All you got to do is fit it in there. The only downside to them is that when those motors were more prevalent and being in production, it never caught on in the swap community. So you're not going to find companies jumping out of you going, hey, here's the headers you need, or hey, this is what we did for motor mounts, or you know, here's a power, uh, accessory drive solution because we know this doesn't fit over here or over there. Um, that's going to be the downside. If you're going to get into one, try to gather as much information as you can. I don't have much because we've never done them. We can do kind of generalizations on them. Um, so it's a good idea. It's powerful. It obviously can make, you know, seven or 800 horsepower upgrades. Um, but they're all used. You got to find the right one. If it's not beat, maybe it's a good deal. Maybe it's not. And then you're going to have to contend with some unanswered questions when you go to swap it. So if you have the ability to fabricate, fire away. It's, it's probably not going to be that hard to do it. If it's something where you're going to rely on catalogs to get the project done or pay somebody to do it, that's going to get expensive or more expensive than you would expect. If not, you know, just do a coyote and put a blower on it. You're going to be about the same power and, and, and abilities. So. Exactly. So Roush Twin Turbo asked a question about how much horsepower can that 4.6 liter 07 Twin Turbo, how much can it make on – how much can – how much power can you put to a three valve, basically, an 07 three valve before the rods decide to punch out and get the fuck out of there? Uh, I was always told like 425, 450 was about what we safely wanted to deliver the car on. 460. NA Coyote, like NA Coyote numbers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, pretty much. I mean, you're a set of cams and maybe a Cobra Jet away from outpowering it uh, based on its limitations. And it's obviously it gets a bad rap, you know, if it, I, I thought about putting a three valve on my car because when I was getting ready to race it, if I can get a three valve motor really cheap, all I needed, all I was allowed to have was 330 horsepower. I can do that with a three valve. The problem was, is they're two to four thousand dollars used, and you still have to buy an eighteen hundred dollar control pack. So if I'm going to spend four thousand dollars, I'll spend forty five hundred bucks, get a Coyote motor, and detune it, and have you know, more potential. So can it be done? Absolutely. If you don't have the aspirations of making seven or 800 horsepower and the wall is deep, then go right ahead. Let's, let's break the three valve record together. I'm ready to help you, but <laughs> um, it's, it's probably not, we're not going to have guys waving that flag, standing at the front of the line going, no, me first. You know, they're going to put a coyote in there call it a day. Right. Jose with the Forte said, Hey, Cletus put a VMP blower on it too. Now I have some thoughts on, about this. So uh -oh. um, I wonder, I wonder how Cletus ended up getting a VMP blower. <laughs> we'll see if he we'll see if he mentions it. I know how he got that. I want to see if he mentions it. Now I'm, I'm on, the, sure. on the Yeah, we'll see. On on the um control pack front and everything, um I'm kinda curious to see how the Cletus uh swap is gonna go with the standalone. They're using I think a Holly standalone controller with drive by wire, which mm -hmm. I think is real interesting that if they can make it work, I think that's really cool for the Ford guys that can use that as an option. I just have really no idea about anything like that. So I just wanted to kind of answer that question that, it, that came through. And some people are laughing at about, you know, the three valve number. Some guy said he's at 493 at 10 PSI. So if I can put in a ticking time bomb emoji in here, I would, but you know, I would, I would, I wouldn't trust a three valve over 450 rival horsepower because you just don't know. Those rods are super powdery. They don't really have any meat to them. And you're literally, literally playing Russian roulette with stuff like that. So I'm not going to play around. Um, on your car, Frank, Frank has a, for those of you that don't know, Frank owns a Coyote Swap Fox Body. Do you, I see a picture up there on the wall. I don't want you to take it down or anything, but is there a way we can see what you got going on? It's a, tell me about the year. Tell me about what's done to it and everything. Well, yeah, that's, I'll just show, I got a better picture of it over here. Let me, uh. Yeah. That's a good look. 
<laughs> that's probably a better picture of it there. But oh, there you go. There's my coop. Um, you know, it was in your video. You you did a good tutorial on it. But if they don't know, it's it's coyote swapped, um, Lund racing tuned. It's full maximum motorsport suspension. Uh, Is that wide body? You got wide body fenders on that thing? Wide body. Uh, Meyer Racing, the 1.5s. Um, it's got some SVE wheels on there now. Because we're kind of transitioning man. from the road racing side over to some uh, 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 autocross stuff. We want to try to get into some good guys events next year. That's my dog. Oh, look at that puppy. <laughs> Bubba, what are you doing? Hey, say hi. All right. Um <laughs> Yeah, it's got our brackets, which last year saw probably about four hours of 7,000 RPM over the course of a year. That's never been off, never stopped charging. Um, it's just been solid, man. And I got to detune to 330. Uh, we had to detune it down to 330 horsepower to make it legal for the class. Now oh, I got okay. tuned up to 400. So I've been driving it a little bit uh, with the power turned up, and it's definitely – a big difference. Um, oh, what the hell is this? Oh, oh, you're going to drop us. I don't know what that is. Is that your, uh, <laughs> is that your ball gag? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's it's going to be fun to try to get it out there, do some autocrosses this year, and, and see how I do driving-wise. So when I do sign up for some of these bigger events, I don't embarrass the shit out of myself uh, next to everybody else. I know it's going to be that process. I'm going to get out there. It's going to have a big wing on it and a big V8, and the Miata guys are going to be sitting there snickering at me, pointing fingers. But, you know, just, just wait. Just hang on. Just, you know, we'll get the training wheels off, and we'll see what's up. That car drove real well, and as Jose with the Forte reminded everyone, I did a full 360 on it, and it was stable the whole time when it did a full 360. I was like, eh, hey, it thinks pretty good when it slides around. So that was rookie mistake. I don't know what the hell I'm doing in a road course. But, hey, if that's the worst that came out of a uh, first time at a road course, then I, I guess I'm not, I'm not doing so bad. But, no, I was really surprised at a couple things on your car. How well the, what do you call them, manual brakes? Mm -hmm. how well the manual brakes work. Tell us about the brake setup on that car and um, because it stops really well for not having, I don't know, vacuum-assisted brakes for lack of a better word. Um, yes, manual brakes, they got a bad rap on the Fox bodies because early on uh, there really wasn't a whole lot of tech put into them from what I gather. You guys are using raw master cylinders. Maybe the leverage on the pedal wasn't as great as it could be. Um, so you ended up they felt like you were, you know, pushing a wall trying to stop the car, and it wasn't really fun. Uh, when we're doing a Coyote swap, if you're doing a Fox body, the brake booster does not fit. Um, you don't bother getting a smaller one. Uh, there's, it's not going to work. So you're either going to do Hydro Boost or manual brakes. Manual brakes with the proper master cylinder mapped out around the calipers that you have on the vehicle or you're planning on putting on there, it's not a hard pedal. It can be a hard pedal, obviously, but remember, in – like we do in road racing, we don't want too much assist because if we're doing heel-toe going into a turn and we're revving the engine, we're changing the amount of assist that our pedal effort is giving us. So now I'm going into a brake zone, I'm downshifting, and as I rev it, I'm increasing the amount of brake pressure that I'm actually applying while not applying the brake pedal any harder. So the manual brakes really keep you honest as far as how deep you want to go. And once you get heat into the brake, <laughs> it doesn't... <laughs> Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> if you really go deep like me. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a real balance because you just don't want to go, like, right through the turn uh, or her. Right, right, right. Uh, so, you know, in your case, when you spun out, you actually never got off the brakes. You just turned right. in while you're on the brakes, which, hey, can happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, I... I didn't get passed by anything that day. Nothing passed me, okay? So cool. I don't care. There was BMWs out there. And that car was at 330 horse when that yeah. when I got it, right? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't at the 400. That was so much fun, man. That little Astro 5, which has now become a TKO 600, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's a, it didn't become a TKO. You got a TKO 600 in there. How it's is it handling, like, right, how, how is it handling 7,000 or so RPM shifts, uh, that TKO 600? Well, we... I never really – I have a GT intake on there, and before it even gets to 6,800 RPM, the throttle body is not opening anymore. Um, ah. So I never took it beyond 7, and it 
in the two race weekends, one was the Nationals that we ran out there. It was four days straight of racing. Um, it, it didn't have any issues. The fluid looks fine. Um, uh, it, it was it was okay. I can't say that there would be any problem with it in that style of usage, especially on the street. Now, you can take these things up to 8,000 RPM, and I'd imagine the story changes, and there's going to be better transmissions for that. Um, are, are you seeing all the gay hearts like I am? I love them. They're great. I think it's the best thing ever. I love gay hearts. It's. I have that uh, all over my house, actually. Sweet. Yep. And the dog just barked. Yeah, they're, playing, <laughs> they're playing back there because uh, I, I left the garage door open, so they think it's playtime. Uh, okay. Hey, come outside. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, uh, Ra- Raid, or Raid 1206, wants to talk about the 6R80. I mean, what's there really to talk about that there, there really hasn't been said? I mean, tell me about the benefits of a 6R80 maybe in a Fox body and what kind of gear set you might need for something like that. Have you come across any issues where rear gear ratio has to really be played with because the Fox body is so light with a 6R80, or can they keep the conventional gear set similar to S197? Oh, they can definitely keep the conventional gear set. Um, remember, 6R80s have a 417 first gear. So if you're a Fox body guy, probably you have 355s or 373s, maybe 410s in there to get A to B a little bit quicker, that's going to be a tough combination to get grip to the ground when you have a 417 first gear. So um, just like we do in the S197s and the S550s, try to keep it in that 331 range, 315. Uh, it'll be a lot more beneficial in a sense and, and, and kind of cut down the wheel spin unless it's specific to your setup where you need it to have that style of gearing. The 4R200 changes that all around, but... I mean, if you're an N.A. Coyote guy, there's probably not going to be a big benefit to changing that gear ratio unless it's like an all-out race car and you want that uh, 274 first gear um, and still have the street driving capabilities and the durability from the 4R200. What's really a good question to ask, and I haven't seen it come across, is with the 10R80s versus the 6R80s because we are getting a lot of calls already for 2018 control packs and swap components. Wow, already. Already. We're we're working with the guys from Muscle Mustangs and Fast Forwards. They're going to do that Week to Wicked project. It's a 66 Mustang. They already have a 2018 motor that's going in the car, and they're going to be using our accessory drive bracket kit um, to get all the accessories on there. It appears there's going to be no issue doing that. Um, so our components will have to change our listing. They should work on the 2018s and up. Um, nothing okay. drastic happened to the timing cover. Alternators are the same shape. Control packs are really going to be the next thing, which I think Ford Racing has something experimental for that project uh, to try out. 10R80s, we all know uh, 10 speeds versus 6 speeds, but um, overdrive, 7th gear being 1-to-1 on the overdrive clutch might be is the hot topic. Can we hold the power that a 2018 can make um, with just clutches? And that's kind of what remains to be seen. And if it does hold, does something else break? I don't know if you saw the one that we have a part of the shop. The intermediate shaft is like, I mean, it looks like it's the length of the transmission. So our current intermediate shafts are 700 bucks. That thing's going to be a thousand. Uh, right. so it's going to change the landscape of how we do things here. And the, there is there hope is the option is there, but is there a potential that when you get big power in a 2018 and you had a 10R80 that you back it down and put a 6R80 in there to hold the power? Because is it going to be more affordable and be more durable? And then are you then trying to put a 4R200 behind it as well? And we'll, we'll see. But uh, as far as the Coyote Swap guys go right now, it's not anything you need to worry about because, honestly, it's not really an option um, until someone comes up with the control packs. It's something we want to look at. But we got a lot of Gen 2 stuff to get caught up on. So Gen 3 or whatever it ends up being called. Um, yeah, Gen 3, probably, basically. It's probably not something that's on our – top 10 list yet. we got a lot of products we want to get to first. Cool. What I'd like to eventually uh, figure out is how to get MT82s in here because the hot topic today on Facebook was Ben Calamer's gear sets. He released yeah, that yeah. G-Force uh, is actually producing. Sorry about the, the focus. The camera's kind of funky. Uh, G-Force actually is producing gear, set, gear sets for MT82s, finally. And then Jaybird Productions, uh, Justin Stevens asked, uh, what do I think about the new gear sets? Have I driven one? Yes. I drove his silver car at Maple Grove at a rental. 
And I'm telling you, if that's the future of MT82, look out because T56s are going to be, if it can hold a thousand horse reliably, and you could still use the RST, RXT, Mantic MT82 clutches, which is a ton around, I think that's going to be a great uh, thing for the future. And unfortunately, I think the MT82 is too big to fit like in a trans tunnel for Fox bodies, but F100s and rides like that have a ton of room or at least more room on the inside to make custom bracketry, custom shifters, you know, like Harvey, Harvey Hutch himself, Triple H, uh, ended up putting a TR6060 from a GT500 in his 60-something F100 and made this crazy-looking shifter. And I'm telling you, dude, that thing looked so mint. It looked like it belonged there, and he's using, I think, one of your control packs, no? Yeah, uh, well, in his case there, he's using the, the Ford Racing stuff. Um, I, actually, I don't know. I, did we, I think we modified. I think he's using I the Ford. Ra- Ford I think racing. he's either using the Ford Racing stuff or maybe your stuff modified. I'm modified. not 100. percent so I, I'd have to. I don't remember exactly. It was a, it was a little bit ago, but um, I think that the MT82. Obviously, we're getting to the point where these things are junkyard pulls. Um, we can get these powertrains used. There's a lot of them out there, and they're seemingly more affordable when they're a manual because the MT82's got such a bad rap, right? Right. So, right. Right. If you get one, the bigger hurdle I think you're going to have, which right now is specific to the 6R80 guys, is shifter, um, or excuse me, drive shaft, because you don't have a slip yoke in that MT82. You got to get a CV style drive shaft. Right, so, right. You know, you're not going to cut up a factory one because it's two piece. If you go get a, an aftermarket one piece, then you're going to modify it, but they're usually aluminum. And from what I've seen, most of the drive shaft shops, that are local to us, they'll do steel, but they don't do aluminum balancing. Um, so it's you have to re- rely on companies like DSS and the different companies that are out there that make them for that application. Just make them to your size, um, which is you know seven seven or eight hundred dollar ordeal. And then shifter uh, being remote mounted. Now we got to find a way to mount it not only in the Fox body floorboard to make sure it fits properly in the console and and all those things and. That's where companies like maybe like uh, MGW and Barton step up to the plate and and come up with something, but they're not going to do it unless they start getting calls left and right. So with any of these MGWs, MGWs busy making wallets, so don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I said it, you didn't. You're okay. <laughs> no, no comment, uh, I guess. But uh, right, right, right. the um, that those companies, I spoke to Dakota Digital not too long ago, and I was kind of screaming at them saying, hey, we need clusters for the SN95 guys. You have a perfect one for the for the Fox bodies. Why don't you have one 94 to 04? It would make things so much easier for those guys. And their comment was, no one's asked us for one. Oh, okay. Well, I told you, I taught you guys at trade shows and stuff, and you just know we have literally a bank where we put all these questions in, and we tally them up, and whatever comes up at the top with the most tallies, that's the next thing we work on. So every time you go to do a coyote swap with an SN95 and the gauges are being a pain in the ass, call Dakota Digital and yell at them and tell them to make you a cluster. They will do it, but they need to manufacture one so you can pick it up from like LMR or somebody like that, and it's 800 bucks and everything's figured out and it looks nice. Those, those, that HDX cluster they make is a perfect fit for the factory coyote computer. pulls all the information, message center, everything, and it's GPS beyond I mean, it's beautiful. This guy keeps asking the same question over and over. Um, uh, let's just answer it. And, and, again, this thing gives me about a minute heads up, Frank. So if I cut you off or whatever, it literally is a timer that goes off, and it cuts off my broadcast. Um, so when it's about a minute up, I'll let you know, and then we'll, we'll end the broadcast. But Cobra Built says or asks, has anyone ever done a coyote swap to a Mustang 2? You know, like the one in um, – what's the name of that movie where the guy's an alien, and he has these little metal balls, and he saves a deer and all that shit? What's the name of that movie? Starman or some shit like that? Anyway, <laughs> he says, I know a four-valve 4.6 with a carb has been done on a King Cobra before, but I think it'd be cool to see a Coyote. Okay. Hey, Frank, what, what do you know about the Mustang 2 and a Coyote swap in a Mustang 2? If someone has done a modular Ford in a car you want to swap, a Coyote will fit. The motor mounts are the same. If you're going to use our brackets and they used AC bracket or AC compressor and power steering from the 4.6, and that's going to be the same. Control packs a no-brainer. 
exhaust and plumbing is really going to be your next question. So um, maybe if you got a Gen 2 motor, the IMRC bulbs in the back of the uh, the intake, they could be problematic. Yeah. But if what I've seen is if a 4.6 fits, then the Coyote's going to fit. I mean, that, it really so, shouldn't be much different than whatever that guy had to do, you're going to have to do. I think Cletus would have had an easier time in terms of fitment to fit a Coyote in a Crown Vic than the GT500, only because of the width of the GT500 itself. Um, I know Crown Vics came with a 4.6, um, and they could just dump, and you could just dump a Coyote in there. But I think it's cool to put a GT500 in there because he came across it real cheap. But a 4.6, yeah. a 4.6, and a Mustang too. I owned a Mustang too when I was 16 years old. Never got it on the road. A 302 was a tight fit. So if they made a 4.6 fit, they they must have had a decent they amount of like, handiwork to get it fit. They like some stuff up, and and you know the Mustang two front end. I don't know where that all coincides with what year car he has, but I know a lot of these cars, the height suspension, all that stuff, it's all based off Mustang two. So I don't know if they have towers that they have to cut out. Um, if they do, most likely that's going to have to go. All the Falcon guys deal with that too. Mustang guys have to deal with it as well. That that um, what I'm liking of these older cars kind of getting resurrected because of the Coyote engine. I think is so cool. Um, the F-150 pullout seems to be cheap, and there's a lot of old cars that have been neglected in people's yards. And all of a sudden they look at them and they go, "Hot dang! What if I put a Coyote in that thing? How cool would that be to ride around in my you know high school?" The car I took the prom, the car I finger blasted my first girlfriend in, all that stuff. You know, they'd love Buddy those Cody. memories to come back. <laughs> Remember her. Nice girl. <laughs> That's great. Like, John Munn has a Maverick that I'm eyeballing, dude. I am looking at it going, now I already got a Fairmont. I haven't finished. But I'd love to just have it. You know how it is. You just want to have it just in case you come across some shit at some time. That That Maverick is actually – Pretty neat. So that's what reminded me when he said Mustang 2, he ended up, uh, you know, saying something about the Maverick. And I'm like, I might want that Maverick someday because you can really – there's a lot of aftermarket support. And there is a Maverick with a Coyote Swap running factory stock in NMRA. It is grabber blue, and it is absolutely gorgeous, and, and I love it. So that would definitely be something that I might look look into. But now the EcoBoost stuff, you talked about that real quick, and we have about maybe seven minutes or so. You guys are delving – into EcoBoost control pack stuff potentially? Correct. Well, we, uh, we, Jake, uh, the owner of Power by the Hour, acquired a, uh, a beautiful 76 F100. And <laughs> very, <laughs> very similar to a truck he had in his youth. Um, found it on Facebook Marketplace or something like that. Went and picked it up. Um, and he drives it every day. <laughs> he does. And he does. And he loves that thing. He, loves he absolutely good. loves that truck. He looks good in there. Uh, not a whole lot of people do, <laughs> uh, but he does. Um, so it, it, we, uh, Mike Johnson drove it to go pick up his motor from, or drop his motor off at NPR and dubbed it Uncle Jesse. Um, and, uh, th that's what the idea there is we purchased a 3.5, uh, powertrain. And we're going to develop the body harness for it um, and put that in there. Not necessarily slammed and sporty with a, a $15,000 frame or anything. Just leave it stock, leave it patina, maybe do some cool speed shop decals or something on there for the shop and just have a 3.5 EcoBoost in it and use it to tow and use it to drive around and deliver parts or whatever we got to do or go pick stuff up. And he can, you know, have a, a developed vehicle. Then the idea there is the body harness that we develop for that combination to then bleed over into developing our Gen 2 control pack stuff for the uh, Coyote V8s and then potentially even the four cylinders as well because That's they cool. do kind of share the same uh, more or less pinouts and stuff like that. But the trick is going to be being able to test all these different combinations um, because we can't build three different Coyote SWAT vehicles at once to test them at the same time, and there's still a lot of different combinations. There's actually, from what I understand, a Gen 1 EcoBoost 3.5 and a Gen 2 3.5. So yep. is it going to work on all both of them? That's going to be, you know, time will tell, essentially. Uh, but I think that's going to be a hot one for the F100s. And before we go and run out of time, I saw him on here a few times. I just want to give a shout-out to uh, Battalion 1. It's my cousin Jason. Best DJ in the world. If you guys need any DJ work for – bar mitzvahs, uh, anniversary parties, uh, house parties, uh, pajama jams. Circumcisions. 
What do they call the Jewish circumcisions? What do they call them? Uh, um, it a name. Well, I know there's a moil. Uh, I forget what, <laughs> uh, what else there is, but you know, it. Um, yeah, he's he's the best. He's on. He's probably responsible for a thousand of those rainbow hearts. Oh, awesome, awesome. Okay, Frank, let's uh, let's end it here because I don't want to get cut off by this. It's a good time to end it. I really appreciate you taking time out of your night, busy night with your uh, what are they called? Miniature greyhounds? What are they called? Whippets? Yeah, Italian greyhounds. <laughs> Italian greyhounds. Dude, I still want those over the top Oakleys. If anyone I'm, out there, if absolutely. anyone out there has over the top Oakleys, two pairs of over the top Oakleys or Folkleys, faux Oakleys. Um, we need them because us bald guys got to rock the over-the-top Oakleys. Like, what's that guy's name? Something Kalita? Uh, was no, it, Kalita? it was uh, uh, Nitro Fish, Scotty Cannon. He <laughs> had, it was Mohawk came out of the center of it, and that's where I fell in love with him. I, I love him. And I couldn't afford him back then. I want the knockoff ones of now, but everybody wants like 500 bucks for them. That, yeah, I had to buy these that. instead. That's- yeah, yeah, fuck all that. You know, I'm looking for I'm looking for something that, you know, you can just wear and look totally stupid. And I want to get the sunburn, the over-the-top Oakley sunburn. That's kind of uh, what I'm shooting for. So thank you, Frank. I appreciate you coming on. You're awesome to come on with me and uh, talk some Coyote Swap stuff. We're going to try to do this weekly. I know I can't get to it every week, but I want to make sure that if I bring someone on, they know what they're talking about. They're down. They kind of get what I'm trying to do. And Frank is the perfect ambassador for the Coyote Swap stuff and the PBH product line so thank you again thank frank you. thank you thank right. you and uh coyote swap everything absolutely don't talk have you later brother have a good night okay you too